So I think um, I want to take this time just to welcome each one of you, those uh, from around and those from outside the country to our today's uh, um, webinar, um, which is on use of regional anesthesia in orthopedic patients. I'll be your moderator, Dr. Rose Hitsinzi. I work in Eldoret in uh, Moe Teaching and Referral Hospital, MTRH. So I think before we start, uh, we'll allow our, chair, our chairman, our chairperson, Dr. Kelo, to give some uh, announcement before we start. Dr. Karibu. Thank you very much, Dr. Shitsinzi, and uh, a warm good evening to all of you from the beautiful city of Kisumu by the shores of Lake Victoria. <laughs> As uh, more people are joining in, I just like to first of all thank you all for making time to attend this and for the support you've given us throughout uh, this series since we started them. We do not take this for granted. And as we are moving towards uh, August, August is uh, traditionally our month for the annual scientific conference. That is going to be the 28th KSA combined with the 8th CCSK. CCSK is the Critical Care Society of Kenya. We are going to have this conference on the 18th, rather from the 18th to the 20th of August. And the good news is this is going to be completely virtual. It's going to be online. And what that means is that you can join from wherever you are, whichever part of the world you are in. I know there are some of us in Kenya who have uh, indicated that they want to join this from the sandy beaches of Mombasa. You're more than welcome to do so. You can go down with your family and join the conference from there. The theme, as you can see for this year conference is uh, recognition and response to emergencies in anesthesia and critical care, the emerging trends. Now, uh, this is just to encourage us to, to register for this conference. Uh, it's going to be a really, really rich uh, in content and the experience is going to be out of this world. We are going to have a number of problem-based learning discussions that would suit you. We are going to have workshops, symposia. There will be poster presentations. There are going to be papers. We are going to have a chance to interact with the industry partners. And once you register, uh, okay, to, for you to register, you can uh, either go to our website, that is www.anesthesiakenya.co.ke or conference.anesthesiakenya.co.ke and the, it will take you through, it's pretty easy. It's an easy uh, uh, system. In case you are having difficulties or it's out of preference, you can also get in touch with the Shell Meet at our office. You can call her and she'll also be able to help you through this. And once you've registered, you, we are going to encourage you, or you're, there's an email that's going to be sent to you to download our conference application to your phone. It's both for Android and uh, the other one is the iPhones, yes. So whichever platform you're on, you will be able to download this. And the moment you download, you start enjoying what the conference has to offer. So it, you don't have to wait until 18th. You can register now, download the app, and you're good to go. And for those who are joining us as part of the industry, we are giving you a great, great platform to meet all our delegates. So kindly share the word with the rest of your colleagues. The moment you sign up with us, you start uh, enjoying the freedom and liberty to interact. So let us take this chance and uh, generate uh, our content that's for the industry and for the delegates that are going to attend this. It's a chance for us to network with each other professionally socially, in terms of business and uh, many other opportunities that will come from this. That is in addition to our very, very, very rich scientific program that we have put together for, for this conference. So I'll encourage you, uh, those of us within Kenya, I can see a number of our colleagues from within the greater Africa, and even I see some from the US, India, please uh, share this word with you circles and join us in this in this conference 
uh, I'll not take too much of your time because this was the day for the CME webinar. But in case of any concerns, you can reach us uh, on our email or through our website. Uh, and we'll be more than willing and glad to, to be of assistance to anyone that's experiencing any challenges. Thank you very much. And I'll hand you back over to Dr. Rosa Shitsinzi to take us through the remaining part of the program for today. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Ari. Um, once again, I want to welcome all of you for our today's webinar, uh, CME. I would like to take this chance to thank the team that has been organizing for these webinars. I think we appreciate the work that you do, especially those of us who are in the, the periphery. We have benefited a lot. So thank you so much for the good work that you are doing. Uh, today, we want to also thank the company that is sponsoring this uh, CME, the Meranin, Meranin Company. I think uh, our senior, the senior sponsor, Mr. Njoroge is with us. We appreciate um, we appreciate the company for sponsoring this CME. Uh, we want to thank even the secretariat and thank you participants for coming for this CME. So without taking much time, I think we'll just move to um, maybe a few announcements. Uh, if you have any questions or the questions that would arise during the presentation, you write them on the chat so that we can be able to um, raise them at the at the end of the the talk otherwise i want to take this time to introduce our speaker today uh, as we had said our today's webinar is use of orthopedic regional anesthesia in orthopedics so our um, speaker is uh, one of us, Speki Nguku, who is an anesthesiologist in Machakos. She works in Machakos Orthopedic Clinic. Um, she's a mother of two, and she has interest in gardening, riding, baking, and writing. She, anesthesia interest that she has, she has interest in regional anesthesia and chronic pain management. So she's actually the best person to present this today. So I want to take this time to welcome our, our colleague, Dr. Nguku, to, pre, to, te, to take us through the presentation. Karibu, Dr. Thank you. Um, just to give you a background, I, I mainly, the type of patients, I mainly do regional anesthesia in, uh, most of the time. I work in a practice where we work with a group of orthopedic surgeons, and in our practice, we mainly do exclusively orthopedics. We see an, a full range of patients from children who have deformities all the way up to all the way up to to uh, quite old geriatrics and so we have quite an interesting mix of of patients which I'll hopefully be able to share um just to get a feel from the audience it looks like we have both um we have both both um, people who are who have been in practice for a long time, so I'm sure I hope I'll be what I will talk will be of relevance, and also pe uh, people who are maybe new in the in the practice. So I'll try to I'll I'll try to hopefully be able to capture everyone everyone's attention. Yeah, unfortunately I will not go into the nitty gritty of each and every each and every block, but I'll just try and 
help you understand some of the, um, the reasoning of why we choose, why we do certain blocks and others why we don't, why we don't do them. Yeah, basically, um, region anesthesia is something that is very easy um, to do compared, uh, in, initially it looks like it has a high, uh, Specky, if it's uh, proving to be a challenge, why don't you email the presentation to, to yes. Admin, then uh, Chalmit can project it. I'm going to email it to her. Yeah, yeah, yeah so that Thank we you. can get started. Thank you. Sorry, it's just taking you a bit of time. I'm trying to do that. I was, I, was, I was wondering if the other presenter can just present as, a, as it's waiting for this thing to send. I don't know what's happening. My net is horrible. Uh, our other presenter was, was actually the sponsoring company, Meranini. Okay. Yeah, so I'm not sure whether she would want to present before you. Uh, presenter, John, 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 are you with us? Mr. Njoroge? Hello, yes, I'm here. Yeah, we are wondering whether you could do your presentation as um, Dr. Specky. Yes, okay. Mm. okay, I think I can go ahead, right? Okay, fine. So since I don't know what you are presenting, I think you can just continue. Okay. Yes. So good evening, everyone. I hope I'm audible. Yes, yes, you're audible. Okay. As you clearly introduced, my name is Simon Joroge. I work with Minarini International, which is a, an Italian company. But in Kenya, we are under Philips Pharmaceuticals, who are our authorized distributor. So tonight, allow me, even as we wait for Daktari to to send her slides, allow me to take us through one of the uh, innovator molecules from Narini for pain management that is of beneficial to you. And uh, with me is Ketes that kicks out pain in within the first 15 minutes. So what is Ketes? Ketes is dexketoprofen trometamol, which is a dextrorotatory enantiomer of ketoprofen formulated as a trometamine salt. And then I uh, want to say that producing a single isomer of ketoprofen uh, simplifies the pharmacokinetics of the drug and allows a 50% reduction of in dosage. Uh, this usually will help in reducing the adverse effects by reducing the metabolic and, uh, and the renal load. And formulating the trometamine salt also, ensure, with the trometamine salt, sorry, ensures that there's fast absorption for the oral formulation from the gut and therefore a quicker onset of analgesia. As I clearly stated, that uh, KTES is a pure enantiomer. So, how does the enantiomerism of KTES help us? Half the dose will equal the same effect, but usually we remove the enantiomer that has no uh, uh, medical uh, impact or medical benefit. So we have the half the dose, with the same effect. And if we have the half the dose, this uh, tells us that we have reduced toxicity and reduced metabolic load. The trometamine salt uh, will assist us in reaching the plasma peak within a, sh uh, a short time and also uh, gives us a short half-life. This gives us the benefit of less drug-to-drug -drug interactions and less variability. 
you would agree with me that uh, previously the gold standard for management of pain has been aspirin. Uh, in, and in terms of classification from Goodman and Gilman, most of us or have passed through, uh, the, the gold standard being aspirin you, was giving us uh, top in analgesia, top in anti-inflammatory and as a, an antipyretic. But with time, because of the many side effects associated with aspirin, uh, I think the molecule has been re left with the pathologist as a blood thinner. But now we have also a class of propionic acid derivatives that offers equal efficacy in analgesia, anti-inflammatory, and antipyretic. And as you can clearly see, we have uh, ibuprofen in that class, we have ibuprofen and dexaproprofen. But tonight, I want to share with you the benefits of dexaproprofen above every other molecule in that class. Number one reason is that we have half the dose, that is 25 milligrams for the tablets, 50 milligrams per one vial. And it's only in that class, it's the only one that comes both as an injector and the oral formulation. And thus, it also has analgesia, a three, an anti-inflammatory, a three, an antipyretic, a three. When you compare to something like the clofenac uh, that we use commonly, it's not as equipotent in terms of analgesia, but is equipotent as an anti-inflammatory and less potent as an antipyretic. So that is a very potent molecule. So uh, tonight, we, I also want to share that in terms of uh, multimodal approach of, of uh, analgesia <clears throat> or, or in pain management, KTES gives us uh, an opioid sparing effect. This happens when you have a decreased dose of KTES, 25 milligrams in uh, oral and 50 milligrams of the, the injectable. When you have this, we have improved analgesia because of the synergy with other molecules like the opioids. And we also decreased the undesirable effects because in terms of uh, 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 giving us the sp uh, opioid sparing effect, it spares by almost 50%. So you'll use less of the opioids, which has uh, so many uh, side effects. In terms of uh, absorption, KTS, as you can clearly see there, which is dexketoproof and uh, 25 milligrams for the oral formulation, reaches CMAX in about 30 minutes. This is not to say that the patient has to wait for 30 minutes. We have seen some of the patients from your practice getting pain relief within the past 15 minutes. And that is why I uh, introduced this as one that kicks out pain in 15 minutes. Compared to other comparators like Ketorolac, Ramadol, Paracetamol, Diclofenac, you can clearly, clearly see that the test has the best in terms of onset of action uh, or that um, the CMAX uh, is 30 minutes. How is uh, the metabolism of KTS. Usually it is through the hepatic uh, route. And all, the only uh, point here is to note that uh, we do take care of the elderly, hepatic and uh, renal, uh, and those with hepatic or renal failure, patients on multiple medication. So with KTS, we advise, or uh, the company advises that in the elderly for the tablets, you do a maximum of 50 milligrams, that's 25 milligrams twice a day. For the injectable, a maximum of 100 milligrams. That's uh, 50 milligrams twice a day. In terms of excretion, again, we also uh, do uh, recommend special care or caution for the elderly, those with hepatic and renal failure, and those patients on multiple medication because most of it most of the of it is uh, excreted through the renal route 
but it's also important to note that KTS is uh, indicated for renocolic. So it's one of the safest molecules for, uh, for pain management for those patients with uh, renal colic. So to prove that uh, KTS is effective in terms of post-operative pain management, in oral administration, probably on the second day or the patient has started taking the oral, we have uh, studies that were done that shows that, for example, the first one was with Tamadol, compared, comparing 25 milligrams of uh, KTS and 50 milligrams of Tramadol TID. It, it shows, showed that uh, with KTS, we required less of the re rescue medication compared to Tramadol. In orthopedic surgery of which we are discussing today, it showed, comparing to Tramadol, it showed that KTS was more effective and had rapidity of action, and it was safer than Tramadol. Uh, in another scenario where we are comparing the placebo, KTS was more effective and uh, more morphine saving, which we termed as uh, an opioid sparing. Post operatively for hysteroscopy, uh, with comparing with Mepivacin, the ketoprofen showed better results post operatively. When you compare keto KTS with the clofenac, in terms of uh, uh, pain relief, uh, it showed that KTS was had more or had a faster onset of action. That within the first one hour, there, there was a clear difference when you compare KTS with the clofenac uh, injectable. And in this slide, we are discussing about low back pain, reduction of pain or with compared to tramadol. And you can clearly see the intensity of pain reduced faster uh, for over a seven day period when you, the patient was on KTS, uh, 25 milligrams TID, compared to 50 milligrams of tramadol TID with all the side effects of the opioid. The pain intensity difference, again, we can also see that there's a clear uh, difference compared to when the patient got an injectable of uh, KTS compared to diclofenac 75 milligrams in that randomized uh, double blind uh, study. Uh, musculoskeletal pain, uh, 25 milligrams was effective compared to diclofenac 50 milligrams. You can see the at 15 minutes, there's a clear difference in terms of um, a pain score. The patient proved to have uh, felt better in the first 15 minutes when you compare the clofenac and KTS. How tolerable is KTS compared to other comparators? So for example, in this, there was a study to show that uh, uh, there was uh, less uh, side effects uh, compared to diclofenac and ketoprofen, where KTS was almost as placebo, 18.4% and 13.4% for the placebo, that's almost similar compared to what we have in diclofenac and ketoprofen, where they had almost double of KTS in terms of adverse events. The clinical trials to show uh, the efficacy or the, the tolerability of KTS there was 844 patients that were put on KTS. Out of those, 3.2% withdrew because of the undesirable side effects. Compare that to diclofenac, there were only 272% and 3.7% withdrew because of the side effects. And we can clearly see a clear difference in terms of the undesirable effects of diclofenac and tramadol that were there. We can only say that uh, paracetamol and opiate were almost comparable in terms of the number of patients who withdrew because of the side effects. But however, as is any other molecule, we cannot lack side effects. And uh, with KTS, <clears throat> uh, there are some 
uh, gastrointestinal uh, challenges that may occur, not in every other patient, but being a typical NSAID, we may have uh, uh, gastrointestinal adverse reactions with risk factors being the age, a history of gastric ulcer, and also if the patient is uh, using other more NSAIDs or antiplatelets. But how do we now manage this? We can use the lowest dose possible. For example, if you are using KETES, KETES has a low dosage. If it's the oral, 25 milligrams, the injectables, 50 milligrams, compared to what we have in the market. Most of them are 75, 100 milligrams. So we can be able to say that with KETES being a low dose, uh, this minimizes uh, the side effect. We can also the minimum duration possible. Uh, uh, this may be two days, the first two days, then the patient uh, goes into oral uh, medication. So this reduces the risk of the side effect. You can also use a proton pump. Uh, being a, a pain medication and having said that KETES uh, has a, an opioid sparing effect, KETES has a very uh, excellent compatibility profile when you're using with other uh, analgesia or other medication that we use in the hospitals, for example, morphine, where we ca you can clearly see that we can direct mix, uh, maybe using um, uh, an infusion, you can mix both as uh, direct or diluted in 100 cc or 13 uh, cc. And you can also, also see that we can use it together with pethidine, heparin, uh, theophylline, dopamine, almost all, all these molecules that you as anesthetist you, you are going to use uh, in your patients in the theater. So KTS has three major routes of administration. And uh, we can use KTS as IV bolus, IV infusion, and IM. For IM, you can do deep IM. So with this, you'll use the gluteus muscle. IV infusion, you can put it in normal saline or as it runs. The bolus, you can push it. Probably this would happen or would be recommendable if the patient is um, on the, the operation table. So just push over as uh, not more, less than 15 seconds. For the infusion, uh, we recommend that you do between 10 to 30 minutes. In conclusion, I'll say that uh, uh, as anesthetists, what we have seen uh, most of you doing, for those who have not interacted with KTS, Usually the, the doctor would, uh, in the operating table, some 30 minutes before they close up the patient, give a shot of KTS. Then the patient, when they wake up, they'll not complain of any pain because uh, they not need any rescue medication until the next dosage is due. And uh, as I have clearly stated, you can use KTS up to a maximum of 150 milligrams per day for the two days. And I think by these two days, the patient will now be able to, uh, to use the, to be table, uh, tapered down to the oral formulation. The undesirable side effects would maybe be the gastro tract and nausea and vomiting could be there. And then a pain at the injectable site. And this varies from patient to patient. So the presentation of KTS uh, injectable comes in 50 milligrams per 2 ml. So this is more friendly when you're doing IM or uh, IV. And the oral formulation comes as 25 milligrams. And this will, we recommend that you give TDS both the, the, tab, the injectable and the tablets. So I believe uh, Dr. Ali now is and uh, probably if anyone has a question, I'll be able to. Or probably before 
uh, I leave uh, or hand over the meeting, let me say that Ketes has been listed as one of the drugs in the Kenya essential medicine list. And that's why in most of the county hospitals, uh, we are very soon going to be getting these tablets uh, as the oral formulation because of the recommendation by WHO where they recommended that, that propionic acid derivatives are equally as important uh, as potent and able to deal with pain compared to the class of uh, or the the commonly used of uh, andolastic acid uh, derivatives, the diclofenacs. They recommended this because of mostly they, they are used to be uh, uh, cardiac uh, uh, side effects or cardiac issues. So that's why I think the government uh, withdrew diclofenac from the essential medicine list and dexketoprofen now replaces uh, uh, diclofenac effective. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Njoroge, for the presentation. So as you have said, I think we'll do, we'll get the questions and, uh, and answers at the end of the presentation. So I can see as uh, presenter, Dr. Speck is, is able, has been able to do, at least get her presentation on the screen. So we'll now allow her to do the presentation, then we'll have the questions for her and for Mr. Njoroge at the end. Karibu Daktari. Hello, Dr. Speki. Can you see the screen? Yes, yes. Okay. So yeah. allow me just to go ahead. So I'm very, very sorry about this. Sorry, I live in a place with bad network and it just so happened that today decided to misbehave completely. So we're going to just, I'm just going to go straight to the point. We're going to talk about some of the common barriers you found in regional anesthesia and why the uptake has been not as widespread as you'd want it to be. Then we'll also look at the benefits of regional anesthesia and the rationale of why regional anesthesia is important, is good. And then we'll finally go through some case discussions to help us um, um, go uh, fully understand this. So um, some of the common barriers that you'd find with regional anesthesia are the biggest barrier we find is lack of training. You'd find that many people are not conversant because they feel like maybe I do not know how to do this block. And so when you have a case where a block has come in, you, you might need to do this block and you're not comfortable, you just prefer to do GA. Then the other thing is that maybe you've tried several times and then you find that your block fails either because the, the block has, uh, maybe you're not so comfortable with doing this block or you've done this block many, many times, but for some strange reason, it is the medication that fails you. You can properly see the nerve, but then the block fails. And so because of that, you feel discouraged and you do not want to do nerve blocks. Then the other one is, which is a very big one, is the surgeons usually act like the captain of the ship in many places where we work. And so if you have a surgeon who is not comfortable about nerve blocks, either because they've had previous bad experiences where maybe it didn't take or, or they have never experienced it, they would, they would just say, don't do blocks, just put the patient to sleep. And so you'd find that if you, if the surgeon is, is the biggest hindrance to you doing the block, then you'd, you'd have to find ways around it. And so some of the tips, we'd want to share some of the tips that you can use to win over the surgeon. One of the ways is just to keep it simple. The time when you are starting to do blocks, especially with new surgeons that you've not worked with, this is not the time to start trying to do blocks that you're not comfortable with. Do the simplest block. Um, if you're doing a finger, you'd rather not do a sub, subclavian block, but then do like a wrist block or wallant or local anesthesia so that you can be able to win over the surgeon slowly by slowly. And so as they see that you have, you are better with these blocks, they would they'd have um, more acceptance. The other thing is, which is a big thing, and when I was asking one of our surgeons, they say one of the reasons why they don't hit blocks is that they're kept waiting. 
So you do this block and then you're waiting for almost an hour for it to tick. And so if you want the surgeons not to be discouraged, let them come and see that by the time they have, they have come into the room, they are thinking that you're going to put the patient to sleep and the real lock is ready and they just go straight to scrub. To scrub. Um, so when they see that they are more interested in, in, in blocks. The other thing is also because you're working in a place where there are various team players, you have nurses, you have other allied staff. So if you want the blocks to have an, an increasing uptick, then you need to win the team's confidence. Your timing of the blocks needs to be very, very good. If you are learning how to do a block, then it's advisable to do the block at the end of a GA, not at the beginning when you're waiting for it to, to, to take. And maybe you're, you're, you're confused. So if you're doing it at the end, then at least you're not worried. If you, maybe as you start to get more and more confident with time, then you can now do blocks uh, when the other case is almost over or just at the end of the first case. And when that happens is that you you would find that your time to do blocks is shorter and there's more, uh, you, you get more confidence. Um, you'd rather bring the patient much, much earlier and block them. You know, the advantage of a nerve block is that it lasts up to 18 hours. So even if the patient was blocked two hours before surgery, it is still okay. It's better than trying to fumble at that time when the surgeon is there and, and, they are, and everyone is nervous. Most importantly is be confident with who you are. Don't doubt yourself. If you do the block and the block is patchy, don't feel like you have failed and by converting to GA. Sometimes you have this temptation, why don't I wait a little bit longer? And as I wait, maybe, maybe um, it'll take. And so you start getting agitated. So if that happens, try and rescue it. Give fen fentanyl, give um, a bit of sedation. If it doesn't work, or maybe you've given ketamine as you're trying to buy some time, if you find that it's taking a bit long, don't wait for the surgeon to tell you convert to GA, just convert to GA. Then next time, it'll be easier as you're doing the block. Now, one of the things that are a way to, to encourage surgeons to take uh, to like blocks is proving to them that the turnover time between blocks is actually short. If you have a, a case which is a block versus a case which is a GA, that the turnover time from the time the surgeon stopped uh, switch, uh, suturing and he's walked out of the table until the time when he comes to the table ready to start, that turnover time is shorter with, with blocks. In a typical time, whenever you're doing, whenever you're doing surgery, you would begin with at the end of the surgery, there are many things that happen. There's cleaning the room. So you'd find the housekeeper uh, goes around um, cleaning the room. Then after they clean the room, the nurses are preparing. The, the tech is also arranging the things, arranging the trolleys. The nurse is trying to confirm, as have, have we done the, the, the signing of the, of the WHO checklist? So there are a lot of things that happen between the time when the surgeon finishes and the time when he's ready to start the next case. And then there's also the time when the anesthesia does their, their time, does their induction until the time when the patient is ready to, for, for the surgery. So the typical turnover time in a very, real, in a very many places, which is um, quite ideal, is around 37 minutes. But you can actually bring it down if you do a block. And the next slide will help you, will help us to see that. So if you were to think about it, the, the conventional operating list, the way it usually works, assuming that it's a GA spine or other things, you'd first wait for the patient in, that's in blue, and then you give your anesthesia, then the surgery in green, and then you clean and set up for the next case. And then when that is over, that repeats itself. So in such a typical scenario, you might, in this specific time block, you might be able to only do four patients. But then now, if you have done the block earlier on, and the block has already set, then you're not waiting for, for the patient and you're not waiting for the anesthesia. So in such a case, you're able to save time and the turnover time will actually just be the amount of time that you take to, to clean the room. And when that happens, you find that you are able now to do almost five or six patients when you would have only done four in that same duration of time. 
in places where the patients are coming from very far different parts of the world, especially in us, Mashinani, you find that if you ask for the patient way earlier, much, much earlier, you can be able to do the block early. And so that when the time the other doctor leaves, you can actually have 15 minutes. And just to give you an example of two, of two times, there's a time when, when we did six patients. Um, we usually would begin at around, the, on this day we began at 10 a.m. Normally we'd begin around 8 a.m. But of note, we were able to leave by 6 p.m. and yet we had six patients. And the reason was is because we were able to uh, bring in some patients earlier and do blocks in them. Another example, this one was now more recent, where we even had, we started at 8 a.m., but we finished at around 8 p.m. And these were much more complex cases where we are doing um, like a club foot correction. That This was a child who was um, um, a young adult who was 19 years old. That one we began with GA because the child, the, the patient completely refused um, spinal. And so when we did that, when then I, uh, I had the good thing is that they had a very, very good assistant. And so I was able to leave and uh, in between the case and get the next patient ready by doing a block. And so because of that, I was able to save time. And even with the last patient who was an ORIF clavicle, it was a very interesting case. We were able to do this by, by regional anesthesia without having to do GA. And that saved us quite a bit of time. Some of the other common barriers to regional anesthesia is in, in many places is the procurement and ordering of supplies. You'd find that you ask, you're asking for this ultrasound, you're asking for these nerve blocks, you're asking for these drugs, and they're taking forever to come. And so it can be quite a big hindrance. And then the admin does not understand why you want to do blocks. You can just do spinal and spinal. Why can't you just do GA, even for upper limb blocks? We've been doing for upper limb surgery, you've been doing this for several years. Why are you trying to change this? And they're just looking at the upfront cost of buying this ultrasound, but they're not seeing the cost benefit. And so that can be a hindrance. And so when you cap, when you add those things together with uh, with time with a, with a surgeon who is not an... So how do you win over administration? The biggest thing is to find the champion with the person who can actually make the decision. So if it's a hospital admin, prove your case that you can actually do more cases. If you're the, you're the main person who is working on that day and you have a long list, that if I am able to do regional anesthesia, I can do more cases and therefore the bottom line for the hospital increases. If you're working in a place where you have influence, maybe talking to some of the people who, who are high up like in the board will help and show the cost effectiveness that if, you, especially in, in our situation where we're using packages the social health insurance, NHIF, where it pays a fixed amount of money per surgery. If you prove to them that if I do GA, it costs me three times more than if I do a nerve block, then they're able to buy, to, to have some buy-in. And then also showing that region, region anesthesia and ultrasound guided blocks can be an additional revenue stream for the hospital by charging a small nominal fee. And so that can help to win them over. And also proving that as you do more day cases or patients that are discharged the next day because they're not in pain or they ambulate faster, that the bottom line, especially with these cases where you have packages, the patients are able to, to, to go home faster. So we are going to talk about the benefits of, of regional anesthesia. And um, this was a young child who uh, was around nine years old who we did by regional anesthesia. And you can see the child was very, very happy. So why is this of benefit? Um, it's a cost-effective solution to both hospitals and to patients. For the hospital, especially like in these cases where you have packages, they have a shorter hospital stay. So if this patient can leave the next day instead of leaving after, after five days, then the hospital makes more money. And also if it was a cash patient, it's of benefit to them that they spend less money. Um, regional anesthesia is cheaper than GA. We've done some statistics to show that it's actually uh, almost a half, a half of the cost of what GA is per hour. Assuming that it, you just assuming that your surgery was just only one hour, and so because of that, there are better margins. And then the patients have a better experience, and especially in these COVID times, no one wants to stay in hospital for a long period of time. There are less complications with some of the patients that you're dealing with. They are geriatric patients, and so when you combine regional anesthesia and multimodal analgesia. You can use it in the uh, in the elderly. You're not giving opioids, and so you, since you're not giving opioids, 
then there are less complications, less nausea, less sedation, and, and better outcomes. The nursing requirements are a little bit less because you're not having patients screaming in pain, them trying to suit this child who is crying and running around giving meds all the time. With this block, the, by the time to the first analgesia request, it takes, it takes some time. And so uh, nurses uh, uh, really, really love blocks, yeah. The other thing is that regional anesthesia, you actually have patients ambulating faster. And so because of that, they recover faster. In places where we have resource limitations, um, it's, it is, in, especially in, 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 low, in low resource settings like where I work uh, in, in the villages, you find that because you, you have patients who have comorbidities and they're older, it is much safer than GA. And so you have better outcomes. Patients are usually worried about dying, whether because they are healthy, they're worried about dying, or maybe this patient has comorbidities and so the relatives are worried that this person might die. And so with regional anesthesia, because it is safer, you have less preoperative mortality. And then you also have patients being discharged faster because they ambulated, they ambulated faster. What are some other specific attributes that are, that are attributable to regional anesthesia? You are able to do patients who regularly, by other methods of anesthesia, you cannot be able to do them. So for example, you'd find like this young man, we were able, we, we, in the particular hospital where I was working, I wasn't able to do a block on them. So we had to do GA. So in giving them propofol, they started convulsing and we didn't understand what's happening. So I thought maybe the, the light, I added more propofol and then they convulsed again. And so I realized maybe the, there's something wrong. And so we had to reverse the patient and then take them to the ward. And so the relatives were asking, what else can we do for this patient? And so because we have regional anesthesia now, the hospital was able to have buy-in, were able to do a block for that patient. And the patient was very happy. The, this is a patient reading a book in the recovery room, waiting to go to the ward. You're able to do a variety of more cases, humerus form and TB, and you can be able to do them as day cases. You have happy patients, children are not screaming when they're being received. Adults, especially after GA who are waking up are not fighting. And so you're happier. There's a fast turnaround time as you saw. And because of that, you have more efficient use of theater space. So a room a day, people, your staff are engaged over a long period of time. And so you're able to do up to nine cases a day if, you, if you've planned properly with regional, with, with regional anesthesia. So what guides you in choosing your anesthetic technique? Um, Choosing the GA versus spinal that is fairly easy to make through, but the biggest things that are important to think about is thinking about the duration of the surgery. If this case is going to take five or 10 minutes, then it, does, it may not make sense doing a, um, a very complex block if it's a very simple thing like on the finger or GA. So you might want to do things like uh, wallant or local anesthesia. If you expect the, the post-op pain to be very severe, then a block is of importance. Then the time interval between patients, there are times when I, would, when I see that the next patient has, was brought in early, then I can be able to do a block. But if the patient was brought um, within, uh, you've been waiting, you, your case has finished and then you're waiting for almost 20 minutes for this patient to come. That's not the time to start telling the surgeons, let's do a block. So the fastest time, sometimes you end up doing this in advent GA because of, because of time. Then the patient's willingness, which is a very big contributing factor. If the patient is willing, then your work is easy. The medical status, people who have crazy comorbidities, then you'd find that you'd, you'd lean more towards regional anesthesia versus GA. Um, surgeon's preference, there's a time once, remember I talked about that patient who did orif, orif clavicle. Um, the patient didn't want GA and the patient was a smoker with very bad lungs and so was scared of sleeping. And so the surgeon told them that <laughs> the, the, the anesthetist can be able to do via um, local. And so I was thinking, and so I was told, the patient comes and tells me, oh, the surgeon said you can do on the local. I'm thinking, what? Yes, yeah, so, so sometimes surgeons can set you up in good ways and bad ways. And also the practice of the hospital. Some hospitals you have to justify why depending on which centers you are in, I hear you have to, if it's an upper limb, you have to justify why you have done a, 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 a GA and not a regional anesthesia. And then of course your skill. If you find that your 
comfortable with these blocks, then you'd find you're doing them more. But if you find that some blocks are very difficult to do, then you might you might lean on to other other methods. And so the types of visual anesthesia are pretty standard. You have the neuroaxial, the peripheral nerve blocks, and local. So traditional just wound infiltration where you add, add good adjuvants like adrenaline, you can add in um, NSAIDs to help um, with the with the pain relief, and then also wallant, which is wide awake local anesthesia without a tourniquet. And so we'll now look at examples of visual anesthesia. Um, so the first case is a, a lady who was 83 years old, a lady who had hip arthritis, hypertensive, and uh, we needed to optimize her before surgery. So for a long time, she's been having this horrible hip arthritis and had refused surgery. And the reason was because her loved one had died, uh, died in, in the intra-op. And so because of that, she knew that she doesn't want surgery. And so when she heard that it is not GA, she was more willing to accept uh, surgery. And so we were able to do spinal, and then we did a fascia iliaca block. And with this, we gave bipuvacaine with dexamethasone. And most interestingly is that five hours after surgery, after the spinal is over, she had, she, they started the physiotherapy and she ambulated. And she was discharged day three, post-op, and three weeks um, after discharge, she was working well and doing very well with physio. Some of these patients were around 83 years. By, by a month, we are still doing physio, but for her, by two weeks, she was, she was doing very well, her exercises, and so she was just coming on the third week just to confirm what exercises need to be done. Another case, um, we had a child who had an uh, elbow fracture. So this child had, it had, had an open elbow fracture. It is towards the end of the day, has just eaten. There's no more space. The next day, the theater is booked. And because it's an open fracture, you don't want to say come back later and there's only this window. And so you're wondering what do you do? What do you want to do? And so we decided, in my mind, I was like, I can't do a block. So what I decided to see is, is, the, is this child cooperative? If the child is cooperative, then we'll, we'll try and switch talk to them and see whether they'll accept. So I said, the way I'll test this is by putting in the IV line. So when you put in the IV line, the child was very comfortable. And, and I told him that you don't have to sleep. You can watch cartoons as you as you. As you're doing the surgery, he was very happy. So that day I had bundles. And so I, as you can see with this image here, um, we gave him the block and my assistant was busy cleaning the, the, the surgeon's assistant, sorry, was cleaning the hand um, to be able to prepare for the surgery. And the child was very, very comfortable. And so throughout the surgery, the surgeon here was checking and asking, is uh, testing, is the child is the child okay? Is there, there no pain? And the child was pretty comfortable and able to do the surgery without any issues. So because it was, we did a supraclavicular block, we didn't want to do an intercostal brachial block around the forearm because that is quite painful. And I promised the child will only have one needle prick. And so the surgeon agreed to uh, do some local infiltration around that to help reduce the, the bleeding. We had another case of a 91 year old lady who was non hypertensive, uh, got injured while right, right, sitting on a border border, and now comes in one week af after the injury with, with ascending gangrene and quite unstable in sepsis. She has, she, when we did an ECG, she has atrial fibrillation and T wave inversion, um, borderline ejection fraction and just some mild regurgitation. Her HB was eight, a blood pressure, I'm sorry, um, I forgot to record it there, but was, it was 86, around over 45, and quite a high heart rate. And so normally, if this patient did not have any issues, you'd be thinking, ah, we have time to maybe optimize them. But then because of the sepsis and the gangrene, we didn't have any time. And the patient has no, there's no aviator in the hospital. So when you, you can see the, I hope you can see the ECG. And this was just when we hooked in the monitors when you were when you are beginning. And so the first thing we did is I wrote a prescription and told the relative, you need to run and look for this medication. So they went to look for it. So as they were, as they were waiting for them, I gave her an elephant to see if you can bring up the blood pressure. And so by the time we are beginning, 
uh, the heart rate had started dropping down to around 147, but still you could see some bit of ST changes. And then when you got the amidaron and we started the infusion, um, things started improving. And so what the mode of anesthesia we did for her, uh, because we couldn't, we couldn't, we, I was waiting for the amidaron, I decided to, why don't we do an epidural in her? And so we started it slowly because I knew it would be gentle. We started with lignocaine. And then once it had taken properly, we topped up with, BP. we were given boluses of bupivacaine mixed with fentanyl. And we were able to transfuse her post-op uh, because I couldn't maintain the epidural and I didn't have enough bupivacaine. I just, we just did, um, we had to do an amputation ab above knee amputation. And so we gave her, um, we, we gave her femoral block. And by day three, she was discharged uh, on oral amidural with follow-up by the physician. Um, the next case I'd want to discuss is a, a patient who was quite a difficult case, a man who had an severe ankylosing spondylosis, almost looked like this. I didn't have an image of the patient because he didn't get consent. And so imagine his neck is a bit more flexed towards the, the chest. So imagine that in the back of your mind. So you have this patient who is coming in, who is 60 years old, has been having a bad hip arthritis, it's worse on the right, and he's also his hips are also flexed. Um, and so he, uh, they had tried to do spinal and were unable to get through. Uh, tried spinal, tried epidural, and then they tried the stand, tried to uh, GA. Um, standard intubation, they were unable to do anything. And so they canceled the case. So the wife uh, was crying. And so the the surgeons and anesthesia team are like, you know what, you need to think something different. And so that time, I, this was being called from a different hospital, so I came to help out. And so when we came, we had to do a different plan. And so we had a, a, a discussed with the relatives that we'll have to try everything that you can with their consent to see if we can help him because they really, he was really suffering in, with bad pain. And so we first tried uh, a spinal and epidural and a CM. The challenge was that because of him, the way his position, we just, can't, we just couldn't get in. Even trying to get into the needle was not possible. So we tried an awake retrograde intubation. We could just get a small margin because of, the, of where the, the neck was. To try, we tried retrograde intubation, it failed. We tried with a track light, it failed because you couldn't see much of it because it's blocked. Uh, LMA, for some reason, the positioning was difficult. And you can't do a tracheostomy because the chin is in the way and you can't see facade because it's fused and we no fiber optic was bronchoscope was available and so I'm thinking I can't send this child patient this lady but this man back to the ward and so we decided we're going to do him under sedation and local anesthesia so we mixed up epivacan 0.1 percent with epinephrine added morphine and diclofena and then because he was spontaneously breathing I just bug masked him with oxygen and sedated him and a little with some minor sedation and we did the hip replacement by that alone. And, and he went back to the ward, was even discharged. For uh, three years later, he fractures on the opposite leg and now wants to have surgery. And so they come looking for you. And so we just knew there's no even bother trying anything else because they, this other, the left leg was too flexed. So you can't even do a nerve, uh, couldn't do a femoral block. And at that time, I didn't have a, a good ultrasound machine that I could be able to do lumbar plexus block. So we just did um, local with sedation. And then when he needed another other hip done, we did the same thing. Then the other case that we had were, that we also had was a, an, an elderly man, 83 years old, who had non-union in tibia for around six months and had been admitted in another facility, but the surgery had been canceled because of his cardiac disease. And he didn't want to go to a higher facility. They don't, they don't have money even for transport. And so when you did a pre-anesthesia review, he had, his hypertension was well controlled. His ECG showed first heart degree heart block, PVCs and left ventricular hypertrophy. And the ECG had, he had dilated cardiomyopathy with the very low EF of 30%, very high pulmonary pressures of 93, severe metral and aortic regurgitation, grade two diastolic dysfunction. 
I remember reading the report of the eco-technologist was saying that this is a very high risk for anesthesia. And so this patient were able to do a femoral and sciatic nerve block and the surgery was performed and was successful. And the patient is well, yeah. So him the other day, he's now 88 years old and now once his prostate removed, yeah. So that most likely might have to be under, under epidural. Then we have another patient who has uh, bilateral, who has bilateral carpal tunnel. And so we did local anesthesia, wide awake local anesthesia, where we're doing in two parts. So the, what, how we mix our concentration is that we, we do, we take 2%, a full bottle of lignocaine, which is usually 30 ml, we add 30, 70 ml of saline with one milligram of adrenaline. And so that gives us, uh, a fairly good mixture that we can that we can use for local, and so we just infiltrate everywhere in the field. But you use almost a very large volume. The typical volumes we do are between fifty to one hundred cc, depending on the patient size. And using that, we're able to do the surgery successfully. And this patient was able to come back the next day. So this can be something that can be quite good, especially for forearm, for hand, and and the digits. And even uh, if you have patients who you would not want to do GA on them. The advantage of this is that it takes very, fairly quickly within 30 minutes before the surgery, you can be able to do it. And then lastly, I know it looks all rosy, but sometimes you can end up having crazy things that happen. Um, this one even happened yesterday. We had a patient who is 13 years old, 58 kgs, uh, who was who was coming in for corrective osteotomy, he has a deformity of where, for some reason, his distal under was not growing. And so his hand was, was, uh, was bent. And so we needed to do a corrective osteotomy. So we did a supraclavicular nerve block and uh, with bipivacin and dexamethasone. Um, and then he developed a little bit of Horner syndrome, which is not unusual. Sometimes you end up seeing it. And then, we did an intercostal brachial block so that you can be able to put the tourniquet. And immediately, I don't even finish doing that. We would keep aspirating before you inject. The patient starts getting agitated and confused. Uh, not, not, the confusion was not yet at that point, but he started getting agitated. And so as you're talking to him, he just says, my legs are feeling funny. And so it's like he's flapping his legs like a fish. So I'm like, this, this child was this, Tina, this team was very cooperative before, so I knew this is something wrong. So I was not going to wait for further. So we just decided to give intralipid. And at that time, his blood pressure started rising. He had tachycardia and a little bit of ST changes. We, um, we gave him some, some bit of midazolam and the intralipid, and he was able to recover well. Um, when he, when he, he was a little bit sedated, then when he woke up, we was waiting for him to stabilize. He asked us, can you continue with the surgery? And so we just continued with the surgery and the sedation and today he's gone home. So in conclusion, what, have, uh, what is important is for you to have a good uptake of regional anesthesia. You need to build good teamwork with the, with the, with the surgeon and, and everyone who is helping on the list. Uh, if they have good buy-in, then your work with regional anesthesia is easier. Then trying to find innovative ways to discuss with with, with admin and other people to overcome some of these barriers. So trying to find ways that you can be able to work your practice to work faster and reducing the time that it takes to do blocks. As you do that, there's more uptake. And also just giving you hope that um, as you continue doing blocks, the, the, the learning does not end. You have to keep there's continued learning. The times when you'd find that you're still learning new blocks, I have not yet arrived, I still have to keep learning and also continuing to mentor others. And as you're mentoring others, your, your skill improves and also the uptake of regional anesthesia increases, increases we, in the society around us. And especially with admin and with the surgeons, continuous, continuously engaging them helps to increase the uptake of regional anesthesia. Thank you. I hope I've not taken too much of your time. Thank you so much, Dr. Specky. You have a vast experience in regional anesthesia. Thank you so much for sharing with us. Um, 
I would want to take this time now to allow questions to our two presenters, uh, Mr. Njoroge and Dr. Speki, and uh, anybody else who might, who can, who, will have, who can in a position to also answer. So from the charts, we don't have much. Maybe we'll allow people to ask, but uh, I only have one, uh, one question from the chat. Or uh, someone has asked, what is the use of dexamethasone in the mixture of bupivacaine for, for filtration? What is the use of dexamethasone in the mixture of bupivacaine for infiltration? Um, Dr. Yes, yes, sorry. Yes, I was, I was, I was, the, the use of the, in the, in, I have not used the, uh, the, the dexamethasone in infiltration. I was using it in the nerve block. And there I was using it as an adjuvant to help in, prolong the duration of the, of the block. So blocks which, which typically sometimes last 18 hours, um, when you add the adjuvant like with dexamethasone, we've noticed that it can actually increase up to um, 24 hours. So that's the reason why I would add the, 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 the dexamethasone. Okay. Mm. So a question from Anthony to everyone. Mm. How readily available is lipid, and what is the cost implication? Um, yeah. How readily available is intralipid? And what is the cost implication? Doctor, you have any? You have yes, an yes. Yes, yeah. I have an answer. The um, intralipid is available in um, in the market. It's available in the market. It's easy to get. 100 ml costs around 1,600 shillings. Yeah. So the key thing, because sometimes you, you may not use it all the time, uh, it's good whenever you're buying to ask for one which has a very long expiry so that it doesn't expire on you, yeah, but it's available. If you do not have intralipid, the, the one which is 100 ml, the other thing that you can do, if you're working in a place which has an ICU and they have total parenteral nutrition. You know, the, it comes with different, it has different compartments. The one it has the white thing, which is the lipid, and then the, which are the rest of the liquids. So you can just plug in. I remember once it happened to me, I was in, working in such a place. So I just plugged into the part which has the lipid alone and it helped rescue. That was in a case where it was a cesarean section and I'd done a, a tap block, transverse abdominis plane block. And then the patient started getting signs of toxicity. They were saying they're feeling some metallic taste. And so that's what we asked for. And we, we use that. So if you don't have intralipid, you can use uh, that component of TPN, the white lipid component. It's, it has the same 20% lipid. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, also, uh, okay, Dr. What about people have to, um, maybe I'll ask now that you have talked about TPN. Uh, what about the people uh, say you can use a bit of propofol because it has uh, the uh, lipid uh, uh, components? Okay, so the propofol will only help you if the patient is convulsing, but the amount of lipid that is in the that is in the propofol is so little for you to get the effect. You'd have to use a very, very large volume and it would not help you. You'd end up having more problems with hypotension and other things. And so it's not advised to, to use propofol because it doesn't have the amount of lipid that is needed. Well, how this works is that the, the lipid helps to bind the bupivacaine. And so it holds it and when it binds it, it, uh, it prevents it from binding with the myocardial the myocardial cells, and so that helps reverse the effects of the of the toxicity. The, yeah. Okay. So another question. Um, mm. 
I think you talked about an epidural in one mm -hmm. of the presentations. Uh, mm -hmm. So, so um, one of us at to buy at to hire uh, is asking, would mm -hmm. that epidural cause more hypertension in aseptic patients? Actually, I would prefer an epidural to a spinal in a septic in in a, in a patient who has hypertension or cardiac issues because it is more gentle and it has a slow uptake. So you do not have these quick drops in blood pressure as you would see, like with a spinal. So it's such an elderly patient, uh, the epidural is more gentle. And so since you're giving it in small, small amounts, it's a bit more forgiving. It's a bit more forgiving. So the quick drop in hypertension is not, it's not as drastic as with, as with uh, spinal. Oh, okay. But then also, it's important to also still have your, your vasopressors ready. So there are times in such patients, you'd find that even your ephedrine is not working. So using adrenaline that you'd add into the, into the, um, into the drip and then titratory response sometimes might work better, might, may, may, might help in such situations, yeah. Okay, fine, thank you. Another question, um, okay, um, Dr. Okolo, mm -hmm. uh, would, would want you, I would want, uh, is asking about your experience with nerve stimulators. Do you use them a lot? Your experience with nerve in, in nerve stimulators? Um, yes, I have some fairly good experience with nerve stimulators. Before I had, before I managed to get an ultrasound, I was using, um, I would initially do them, I was initially doing them blind and then using nerve stimulators and then, and then the ultrasound. So it works very, very well. Yeah, the advantage of, especially with the, the times when I want to, I don't routinely use a nerve stimulator in all patients because it's, it's a bit more expensive all the time because the nerve block needles you, are a bit more costly. And so because I work in a resource limited setting, I use mainly spinal needles with an, with a, with an extension and I'm able to do the block. But so I reserve the nerve stimulation um, for cases that where I, I cannot have I cannot afford a, a high error margin. So for example, there's a time when we went for a, an outreach medical camp somewhere, somewhere remote. And there's a patient who had multiple cardiac issues and controlled hypertension and diabetes, and they needed to have an, an Austin Moore hemiathroplasty. So now with that patient, because I wanted, I, do, I wanted to do a lumbar plexus block and I wanted to be absolutely sure where I am, I, would, I, I now used a nerve stimulator in such a situation. So the nerve stimulator would, would guide me in the proper positioning. And especially if you're in a place where you're learning, it's a good, and even still if you're not learning, if you have the ability to use it, it, it it's, it's advantageous because it helps you see where the, the correct position of the nerve. But then now with more use of ultrasound, it's not as commonly used or routinely. Yeah. Okay, let's also have questions on um, can't see the drug, the, uh, the uh, sponsoring drug company presented. I think we are only getting questions on uh, regional. So let's have any questions on the uh, sponsoring company. Um, but as we are waiting for them, we can continue with this. We are almost closing. So Dr. according to your experience, what is the best choice of nerve block, a nerve stimulator versus anatomical landmarks in relation to patient turnover? What is your best choice of nerve block, nerve stimulator versus anatomical landmarks in relation to patient turnover? Yeah. Um, when it will depend on what, so let me just give a, a scenario like, for example, if you're doing upper limb, if you're doing upper limb, uh, if I'm just choosing between nerve stimulator and anatomical all the time, I'd be, I'll be more biased towards the nerve stimulator. Yeah, because 
you you are you are very sure that where you're putting in the drug it's actually the right position the thing about with the nerve simulator you have also to be quite vast also with your anatomy so you have to know that if i put in the needle too shallow for example i might be end up having more of um skin twitches so let me give the example like the one the the patient was telling you about who we did uh, we did the lumbar plexus block so if then if the pos- if you're pressed for time and you're using the nerve stimulator once you are very sure that you're getting those twitches in the in the patella then you know that this is the right position of the of the of the block and so if if you're doing it that way, I find that it works better. With, of, with anatomical landmarks, the challenge I find with it is that there are a lot of patient variations. People are, are different. Eh? Sometimes when with ultrasound, you actually see the anatomy, there are little bit of changes. Where you'd expect the nerve to be, it's maybe just slightly a little bit off. And so if you have the nerve stimulator and you have the resources, you have the needles, I would advise just just use it, yeah, yeah. As a as a as a thing to keep practicing, always when you're using the nerve stimulator, always draw the landmarks as you see them in the book, mark it, and then that the point at which it tells you, put your needle there, put your needle there through using the nerve stimulator, and you will get the, the, the 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 position. Yeah, I remember once I did that, and then I was not getting any twitches, and then I realized I'd forgotten to attach the ECG lead. On the link. So here I am adjusting current, but nothing is happening. So always remember to attach the ECG lead on the limb. Okay. Fine. I think there was a need for clarification about dexamethasone with PP mm-hmm. again. Mm-hmm. I think one of us would like to know whether you are adding, but mm-hmm. why you are adding dexamethasone adjuvant to PP again. Mm-hmm. Was mm-hmm. it for pain? Was it for pain management? The dexamethasone uh, and the endurance. Okay. So the reason I was adding dexamethasone to the bipivacaine, and um, we not, I noticed that it's, and also sometimes in, of course, literature sometimes gives you different things. Sometimes, depending on the article, sometimes they tell you that you get, um, there's no additional benefit. There's no additional benefit to adding the bipivacaine. But then also the other studies that tell you that when you add the can it prolongs the duration of the block and it also gives you a denser block. Um, I've noticed that it also increases the, the onset of the, of the, it makes the onset of the, of the block faster. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I think uh, most of the questions you've answered, um, we have a lot of comments. Um, maybe this comment can go to everybody. Use of diluted local anesthetic solutions for anesthesia often leads to patchy blocks that tend to take longer to establish. That was from Nganga to everyone. And then uh, another comment. Oh, OK, yeah, that's from Kevin Umani. Uh, thanks, Dr. Specky. Uh, Honor's syndrome always is common in supraclavicular blocks. I think when you made a comment about a patient developing Honor's syndrome. So I think from experience, I think it's a common, uh, a common complication that you would get after supraclavicular block. Otherwise, uh, any, any uh, comments or uh, questions to Ketsu. People who have had any experience on the use of the drug. I work in a peripheral hospital. We are not yet, we don't have the Ketsu at the moment, but we have seen them. But if we have not yet, personally, I've not used it. I don't know that there's anybody who has any experience and would want to share. So as we are waiting, 
someone has asked, can the hexamethasone be added in lidocaine or is it just bupivacaine alone? Mm. I think you can. You can. You just I, I, I think you can. You just I have not. I have not added it to 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 okay. lignocaine. And the reason was, and the, the main reason is why I have not added this. Um, at least for me, my personal reason is if I want it to have a long duration, I find that when I add adrenaline, it gives me a longer duration. So I've not seen much, much more benefit with adding dexamethasone to lignocaine, but I'm sure it can be added. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, Kevin Numani says it can be added. So I think he, he must have had an experience. So it can be added. So I think that is the end of the question, the question that is, we had. I know one, one, one thing that might be a hindrance for quite a number of people um, in doing some of the things you are doing is the, the issue of getting the ultrasound. I think ultrasound is not, the ultrasound is not um, available in most places, but uh, with your um, experience and the presentation, I think we should be encouraged to get ultrasounds uh, so that we can be able to do this because we've seen the advantages of doing region anesthesia. Uh, we used to teach, I think we still teach and say, if you are doing spinal anesthesia, you should be ready to give GA. I'm not sure that that is still the same thing, Dr. Ari. That you have to be prepared to give GA. Mm. Yes. Mm. Yes. Yes, that's true. Okay. Yeah, that, that's very true. And also the, just to just give you hope, the prices of ultrasounds are actually dropping. You know, before you'd hear ultrasounds were going for up to 5 million shillings. And for those who are in, who are, that could, that could be almost be $50,000 to other, in other in equivalent of that. But then now the prices have really dropped to almost, 500,000 or 600,000. So the prices are, are coming down. And if you're able to, yes, in fact, someone here has said that it has dropped to $5,000 down from 50,000. And so it's becoming affordable. And with some of these companies that you can actually have a, a plan with them and others that the first, before, before my current ultrasound, the first ultrasound I purchased for myself, I imported it from China and it was quite affordable. It was way below that 5,000. It was almost $3,000. $3, and so they're becoming more and more affordable. And so if, if you, the way to think about it, if you want to buy for yourself personally, it, it makes sense. The hospital did not buy for me. And, but I, I, I know that this is something that I wanted to do and I didn't want to keep losing my skill. So I saved over several years to be able to afford to, to buy. And then when I needed to upgrade to the current one that I have, which is a butterfly IQ, I, I, with one of the companies, we were able to get a good payment plan and it and, and became affordable. So I just want to encourage you that it is possible. And especially seeing how, when I look at the counties and how much resources is being pumped into anesthesia and into ICU, um, these things are not, they're, they're within reach. And I think it's just to, to build a, a case, a case for it with the surgeons and with the administration. And it'll, and it'll happen. It'll happen with time. We just keep fighting. It will happen. I must really, really apologize about, about the presentation not being able to start well. It's, uh, I can't blame technology. I just don't understand what happened. Yeah, but I'm, I truly apologize. And kindly I ask for your forgiveness, yes. <laughs> no, but that, it was worth us waiting because I think we've learned a lot from you. Um, another thing I wanted to point out before we finish, uh, you realize that Terry says she bought the ultrasound alone um, by herself. She even mentioned to me that she actually buys even intralipid. She purchases for herself uh, when it's not available. So these things we can do, we should not say it's not available. 
So she has challenged us. We can be able to do a lot on our own. So I think we are coming to the end of this pro of, the, of the presentation of this uh, the webinar. I just want to make a few um, a few announcements, and uh, before we before we close, we'll also allow our chairman, Dr. Okello, to make another announcement. So the recording of this uh, presentation will be on uh, KSA website on YouTube and on Facebook. So for those who would want to listen to them again, you can be able to get a chance. Then um, CBD points will be uh, sent to your e emails. And uh, for our doctors and uh, um, uh, who are not locals, you'll get the certificates. And also the nurses and the CEOs, you'll get yeah, the certificates. Um, so I would want to take this chance just to thank everybody for finding time to log in and listen to our speaker, uh, two speakers. And I want to thank Dr. Um, Specky so much for making this pre uh, presentation. It is quite enlightening. Um, I also want to thank um, Dr. Njoroge for presenting um Ketsi to us and also for sponsoring this uh webinar we really appreciate uh so thank you everybody for making time to attend this uh, uh webinar so before we close i would ask uh, dr kelo to make um, an announcement Thank you very much, Dr. Shitsenzi. Uh, I made uh, an announcement at the beginning, but for those of us who are not there, it is about an event that is going to happen in August. Uh, 